Hello everyone. Thank you for joining me on this midweek Bible study. I've been thinking about the fact we're in a time of plague and inevitably we've got to go to the book of Exodus with the famous ten plagues. In fact Exodus also has the Ten Commandments and then ten features of worship at the end as Moses set up the tabernacle. So Bibles open please in Exodus and we'll look at all the great features. That book is going to finish with the glory of God descending upon the tabernacle. And that reminded me that here at St Mark's we have nine brasses with a dedication to the glory of God and three wooden items or pieces of furniture dedicated to the glory of God. And I'm standing in the far right or encompassed directions, the southwest corner, in front of a brass that you won't see, but let me tell you it's dedicated to James Harvey Simpson, the first rector of St Mark's. He turned up in 1952, age 27, and he hung around for 53 years. The feature is the opening line, to the glory of God. And the whole of St Mark's is full of these dedications, not just in brass and wood, some in panes in window, to the glory of God. Just encouraging us again and again to say, this is what life is about. Jesus prayed that he would glorify his Father in John 17. And the Apostles say, 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. The root of the word has a sense of weight. We sometimes say that someone in authority has a certain bearing about them, a sense of impressiveness, as if there's a force of nature which is them. God has the ultimate glory, the ultimate weight, the ultimate honour is due to him. So we're going to go to Exodus to find out how this business of glory works. It's the second book of Moses and we'll start with the ten plagues. So since Eden, man's rule breaking has been compounded by violence, punished of course with the flood, and pride, work on the Tower of Babel, halted by that separating gift of languages. Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, the fallible patriarchs, carry the promise of many descendants to bless the world, but Genesis ends with their offspring in Egypt, not Canaan. Worse, Exodus starts with the people enslaved and the male boys facing death. But one who escapes the order from a paranoid pharaoh is Moses. And we catch up with him aged 80, returning to face the king of Egypt. But his old classmate refuses to let the Hebrew labour force go. And in view of the pyramids, Moses announces punishments from God on to Egypt. Each of these plagues will humiliate Egyptian gods. So turning Water into blood declared power over Harpy, the god of the Nile. Turning frogs into the land as a plague, uh, authority over Hakar, the frog-headed deity. When you had plagues of gnats and flies, that had authority over Kepi, the god of creation, and Hathor, the goddess of protection. Uh, livestock plague showed God's authority over cows, considered divine holy cow and all that. Uh, boils showed authority over Isis, the goddess of medicine. Hail over Newt, the goddess of the sky. Locusts were taking authority over Seth, the god of disorder, and using him for God's pleasure. Darkness famously over the sun god Ra, and then the plague on the firstborn, over the pharaohs themselves who claimed to be divine. The intention was, well, what was the intention? You can find the detail and count four purposes. 
The intention is the name of the Lord will be known firstly by the Israelites, chapter 6, verse 7. That the name of the Lord will be honoured by Pharaoh, chapter 7, 17. That the name of the Lord will be known throughout the whole earth, 9, verse 16. That the name of the Lord will be known by future generations, 10, verse 2. Well, that's a bit distant from us. I mean, how does that fit us? Well, a God is whatever you put first and whatever you trust to help you. So what would you say Britain's gods are? Well, I, I think I'll boil it down to five and uh, they're all in a sense invisible. These aren't the stone statues of Egypt or the great features of the natural world that impress them. Uh, warning long technical term, terms coming. Sorry, please bear with me. So, these are my five. Uh, materialism, the belief that stuff matters more than people. Hedonism, that pleasure is supreme. Narcissism, that I am the centre of my world and it's always only about me. Scientism, that technology solves every problem and gives us control, and universalism, that all viewpoints, philosophies and religions must be tolerated and are equally true. Now, that's, that's not bad as a, as a go, is it? I mean, I've drawn them from many other thinkers. But bearing in mind that that is essentially the situation in modern Britain, does not God have the right to challenge our ferocious commitment to these false gods. First bit in Egypt is the Ten Plagues. Then we come to the Ten Commandments. I know, I know, you can preach a whole sermon on each of them, so real danger of overload. I'm just trying to give you the big picture, rather like flying over a territory and you just see the main features of a river and mountain and so on. Well, the Hebrews have a last meal in captivity before the angel of death passes over their houses as he inflicts the last plague on Egypt. Hebrew homes were identified by doorposts painted with the blood of a sacrificial lamb. A picture for believers today of sheltering by faith under the blood. Finally, allowed to go, hundreds of thousands of runaway slaves make for the promised land led by a pillar of cloud, or by day, the pillar of fire. And if you think that was clever, the same pillar, when the Egyptians caught up with the Hebrews, having changed their minds and said, we ought to keep you, was fire for one side and cloud for the other. The Red Sea parts for the Hebrews, but destroys their enemies, and the diet for the rescued people of God becomes manna flakes for breakfast, quail nuggets for dinner, and water on tap from the rock. Then came the question of identity. Bearing in mind that we are rescued, with no arms, no training, amazing we are free, what sort of identity should we have as a nation? Well, God gave, chapter 20, ten words to teach what God and godliness are. So to love God, the people must have no other gods. Egypt had many, but there's only one creator. They must make no representations of God. Egypt had many, but a picture cannot do justice to the many faceted character of the Almighty. And the people must not misuse the name of God, so overusing it is a magic charm or underusing it while preferring another. And yet the name of God, or names, are of supreme importance in Revelation. He is the self-sustaining I Am. He is Lord, Shepherd, Rock, Refuge, Father. And the people mustn't work seven days a week as they were made to in Egypt, because now we have a creator with a creation pattern of working just six days in a week. Now, to love your neighbour, you must value uh, parents and life, marriage and property, reputation and contentment. Just as God honours the patriarch, sustains life, is bridegroom to his people, 
respects lands and nations, speaks truth, and has joy in spirit. Now, all that moral law is affirmed in the New Testament. But hold on, don't we have thousands of laws and accumulate them all the time? Yes, but as one person has said, our main problem is we forget the original ten. Where have we got up to? Ten plagues of warning and punishment, ten commandments of direction and identity, and then ten aspects of worship. I know, there's so much here, but we play it at your leisure. How about that? The legal detail sets up a new world. Theft must be repaid. That's easy, isn't it? I mean, it's so simple. Just give it back. An eye for an eye limits retaliation and computes it into financial terms. But murder and adultery merit the death penalty because they are so offensive to the way God sets up life. Now, with such a penalty, of course, not many people try it. There are no prisons. Most important of all is the worship facility at the centre of the nation. The staff are the priests, and Jesus becomes both our priest offering sacrifice, which is himself, and our high priest leading us into the presence of God. The curtain within the two rooms, separating the two rooms within the tabernacle, uh, so the holy place from the more precious most holy place, will be torn according to the Gospels as Jesus died, which shows that the way open to heaven is now made because of Jesus' death. And at the far end, in the most holy place, is the ark, a chest the size of an office desk. Overlaid with gold, signifying glory, it contains what Exodus 25, 21 calls the testimony or the commandments and has a lid called the atonement cover or mercy seat. The terms are uh, legitimate translations from the Hebrew. To cover is to have mercy or to forgive. So, have you got those first three? The priest goes in through the temple to the covenant box. Or, Jesus, as a person, uh, sees his achievement opening the way to deliver the gospel to the world of unchanging moral standards covered by mercy for the penitent. What a start! The remaining seven items signify what the gospel creates. In that most holy place was also the altar of incense, a symbol of our prayers ascending to heaven, according to Revelation 8. Step out back into the main approach hall, uh, the holy place, and you find the seven branch lampstand, pointing forward to Jesus, the light of the world. But Psalm 19 says the scriptures give light to the eyes. So that's how we hear Jesus today. There's also bread on the table, which looks ahead of, to Christ, the bread of life, and his welcome at the breaking of bread in the service of Holy Communion. Outside in the open air is the altar for sacrifice, and according to Hebrews 13, we now offer a sacrifice of praise, and besides it, a basin for washing, and baptism identifies a life cleansed by God. So pointers, symbols, anticipations of prayer and Bible study, of communion and baptism, and of our singing. Two more features. At the tabernacle, later the temple, was where God said, I will dwell among them, Exodus 25, verse 9. And Jesus, we're told, made his dwelling literally tabernacle, John 1, 14, amongst us. Before his apostles taught the church that you yourselves are God's temple. That's marvellous, isn't it? Whether you have a church building or not, believers are the living stones and God's Spirit lives among them. All this was set in a courtyard, the area of half a football pitch, with a fence that excluded non-Jews. But in Ephesians 2, Paul explains that the cross tears down the dividing wall of hostility, and so mission is now to the whole world. Wow! Marvellous! so full of meaning. Friends, ten aspects of worship, just to jog our memories about what we must do apart and what we will do when we're back together. 
So let's reset our eyes on the glory of God in loving warning, in moral living, and in worship in spirit and in truth. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want to give you the glory for scriptures in our own language and freedom to read them. We want to give you honour for the joy of drawing so many ways upon spiritual nourishment, even where apart. And we want to give you our praise that uh, life is still uh, bearable for us and so many blessings are around us. But we do yearn for that time when we're back together. And when we come together surrounded by these 12 inscriptions in brass and window and uh, wood to your glory, may we truly live to your glory. Because we know your hand is upon history. We know that uh, your word is clear for the way we should live. And we know that you have given us direction how to honour you, praise you and glorify you. So give us the courage, the strength, now and always. Amen. I finish with a verse and a chorus from a hymn, To God Be the Glory. To God be the glory, great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his Son who yielded his life and atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father, through Jesus his Son, and give him the glory. Great things he has done.